What exactly am I looking at here? Hello everyone, this is the second video in my series of reviews of the Famicom Wars franchise, also known as Advance Wars and Game Boy Wars. And today, we're looking at the Game Boy Wars games, or the first four of them anyways. Game Boy Wars has a bit of an odd history. In short, the first of them came out in 1991. An update to the original game followed six years after, along with a promotional version of said update, followed by a real sequel shortly after Famicom Wars got its real sequel. To make things even more confusing, every Game Boy Wars after the first was outsourced to Hudson instead of being developed by R&D 1. But enough history, let's get into the commercial! The biggest difference between Game Boy Wars and its predecessor is the use of a hex grid, meaning every tile has six surrounding tiles instead of four. I actually don't think that works so great for this series, but then again I've played Game Boy Wars the least out of any game in this series, so I don't know a that much about what makes a good map in this game. It certainly makes building walls out of units a lot harder, which is probably going to be more artillery spam. Optionally, you can play the game using a new rule, Fog of War. In this mode, you can only see the tiles within the vision range of your own units. This really just slows things down more than anything else, since you need to now reveal the enemy units before moving into strike. And since you don't know where the enemy is going, planning a route through a stage becomes harder. Fortunately, it's only an option. Oh, and speaking of slowing the game down, I may as well say it here. Game Boy Wars is slow. Horrifically slow. You're trying to put an AI on a Game Boy game for crying out loud. I guess Nintendo felt the same way, because they outsourced the second game, Game Boy Wars Turbo, to Hudson, who had the goodwill to significantly improve the speed of the game. Okay, it's still not that great, but apparently Japan liked it well enough, because they released a promotional version of the game containing custom maps sent in by readers of Weekly Famitsu, making this edition of Game Boy Wars Turbo the first game in the series to feature user-made content. As for the opinion of this, a modern-day Advance Wars player, uh, the speed of the original game combined with its horrific level design makes it nearly unplayable. Behold the return of Fist Peninsula! Observe as the enemy builds seven units to your four. The turbo versions don't do much to improve things either. Was this play-tested? They apparently delayed it a year because the title screen shows a date of 1990 even though the release date was a year later. The only game in the series I can recommend at all is Game Boy Wars 2, both due to being the fastest of all three and sporting the best level design. Not that that's saying much, look what I'm doing to the computer in this very strange map. Anti-air tanks don't attack land units in this game, yet the computer sees fit to build one and allow my foot soldiers to lock him in place. Not to mention all the other strange maps the game has to offer. Other than the hex grid and some rebalancing, there aren't a lot of changes to the core gameplay or new units between games. Capture buildings, destroy enemies, clear all the maps, unlock a final map, same as Famicom Wars. Only now there are even more maps, including a set that actually changes depending on the country you selected. By the way, why is Blue Moon called White Moon? Ah, oh, never mind. The Navy got expanded to include aircraft carriers and submarines, which are indirects, I don't know why. And there's also a new static gun battery unit that can't move far on its own, but can be loaded into a... A supply truck? You can load the massive gun battery onto your supply truck. Huh? 
Hudson's third game in the series was Game Boy Wars 2, and it's definitely deserving of the 2 in the title. The gameplay is faster and sleeker than ever thanks to the Game Boy Color, more maps were added, and for the first time ever in the series, a map editor was added to allow users to create their own scenarios. But wait, it gets even better. Hudson had released their own strategy game, Nectaris, aka Military Madness, on the Game Boy, and it was compatible with their newest peripheral for the system, the KISS system. The KISS system allowed compatible games to send data to a PC through the IR port, not on the Game Boy Color itself, oh no, the IR port on the cartridge. This allowed players of Nectaris or Game Boy Wars 2 to send custom maps or save states to the PC and share them with other users, which is a great innovation to say the least. It was even possible to download maps off Hudson's website, although the site is probably shut down by now. Still, it's amazing to me that Nintendo never even did anything like this with their coming Advance Wars games. Fans had to share maps between each other on their own sites. The system even let you do link battles. You had to pass the Game Boy between you and another player in the previous games. Overall, however, Game Boy Wars unfortunately does not pan out well at all. Game Boy Wars 2 might be worth a look, as it was very innovative for, for its time, much like Famicom Wars was. Strategy games at the time were still in the sort of state where they weren't bad, but they weren't really really good either, because they didn't know where they were going, and there was excessive game length and lots of waiting for your turn to come up, because AI wasn't that good at the time. Super Famicom Wars is the only game out of these first six that I can see someone putting serious time into, and that's being a bit generous. Next up is the fifth and final Game Boy Wars game. It's an entirely different beast from its predecessors, which is why it gets its own video, so look forward to it.